Hi, CS 151 students. It's Professor Pierce. And this is a repeat of the uh, lecture for last Tuesday. I guess that would have been the 17th. Somehow um, I recorded it to the cloud, but I guess I've read that, um, I read that, that Zoom has been having trouble, you know, with everybody uploading stuff to the cloud. So I'm now uh, just re recording it locally and then uploading it to, uh, to YouTube. Uh, so uh, that's right. So I'm blaming it on Zoom here. It couldn't have been my own incompetence. Uh, so let's see. I think before I get started, uh, I've been getting a number of questions, you know, about the homework assignment, the project you're working on. I'm going to zip over there real quick. Um, I'll put some of these windows up here that I don't need. Right, so the SimStation project. So phase one, uh, the team leader will turn in a design model and a task schedule. So let me just give you, uh, let me just give you a sense of this. I'm going to come over here and start up star UML. Okay, and here I'm going to title my project. Uh, what are we doing? SimStation. And I'm going to get rid of this model. I don't like that model. It'll do me for free. And then I'm going to go over here to the file menu and do import a fragment. Okay, now I have given you, if you go to the bottom of the MVC lecture, uh, you'll see like a zip file there, which you can download that zip file and unzip it. And it has in here Java fragment dot MFJ and MVC fragment. So I'm going to open that and boom, I've got like Java in there. Let's have fun. So let's do it again. Import fragment. We'll do MVC. So these are my latest versions of MVC and, and Java. These are always works under progress. So, so, um, you know, I'm constantly adding uh, to these things. Um, so then uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see. Here, I'm going to pause the video for a second so I can throw my cat out. Okay, cat has been thrown out. So then, uh, let's see, where was I? I'm going to add a new package. I'll call this package SimStation. I'll add another new package. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't matter, model, subsystem, package, they're all the same. You know, according to star UML, the subsystem you know, is a package that contains, you know, a model of some kind of a subsystem, and then a model contains, you know, a model, but they're all just, you know, packages in the end, so, and I don't know if that's universal at all, that terminology, or if that's just star UML. Let's see, what are we doing? Uh, we are doing flocking. That's the one with the birds flocking. Uh, let's add another package here for, um, let's see, random walk. Here's another package, and we're doing play. And another package for, um, what was the other thing that we were going to do? I forgot. Let's see. Um, oh, I think it's Prisoner's Dilemma Tournament, PDT. And then I'm going to put a class diagram in each one of these things. So here I'm going to add a class diagram. Okay, and in here I'm going to have this is so far from the class. There's a simulation class. There's the agent class. 
Here's that bidirectional association between them. And then I'm gonna go over here to MVC. And here I have this model. I'm gonna drag the model over here. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna suppress all of the attributes and I'm gonna suppress the stereotype. Um, if people wanna know about that, you know, they can go in and look it up in the, uh, can go look it up in the um, in the MVC package, and the simulation is then you know going to be the the model. Okay, so this is just the beginning of it, right? And so then you know you'd fill in you know more details here. Now uh, some people were saying, so I think I gave you this much in the diagram. Yeah, so I even gave you, you know, more information. There's serializable and runnable, so you can drag them in. Here, let's do that since we're at it, just to, just for fun. Um, so they should be in Java. And you're free to, like, add to these things. Here is serializable, and here is runnable. And then since these are interfaces, I would choose interface realization. Okay, now you might be saying, well, what about model? You know, doesn't model need to be serializable? Yes, but it already is. Remember in MVC, Gosh, I hope I have more than that in here. Eh, this looks actually, um, this looks a, actually a little anemic here. Um, I may be missing some stuff. Maybe I'll like see later. I mean, here I'm missing a bean class. And I am missing, what else am I missing there? So Bean uh, then uh, implements a bunch of interfaces. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think that this is not my latest version of MVC. So uh, let me update that. I'll do that tonight, and then you can download it. Uh, you can download it tomorrow, maybe. But uh, so I'm missing a whole bunch of stuff in there. It's it's a, like an older version. Um, so then, uh, for example, um, here, collapse some of these here in, and what you would, do, so there's a lot more work to be done in SimStation other than just this. I mean, there are the commands, um, you know, I think there are five commands, there's the views and so forth, so we need to specify all of that. Basically, any classes, any major methods. And then, uh, for example, um, let's see, um, random walk. I'm going to add a class diagram to here. And I think we have a random walk. And we would have drunk. And Let's see, then I go to sim station and random walk extends the simulation and drunk extends agent. Now, how good should this diagram be? Well, you know, um, Pretend like, you know, you've just been, you know, hired at some software development company and, you know, this is your first assignment you know, to uh, come up with these design documents. How good should they be? The other thing, too, is that it might be possible. I don't know if it's a good idea, but it might be possible to share some of this work like, OK, Jones, you do random walk. And Jones does random walk. And look, first of all, you're all using the same Java and MVC starting point, right? Um, maybe even SimStation. 
you know, and then Jones does random walk and he exports it as a fragment and the team leader could import it and add it to the, you know, to the, uh, to the primary uh, release. So um, the other thing is that, um, the other thing is the schedule. So, um, so I'd like to see some detail there. I've seen a few schedules that were pretty good. You know, there's making these diagrams, uh, doing the model, of course. Um, but there is also, you know, when you start developing SimStation, you know, who's going to do the view part? Who's going to do the commands? Who's going to do um, the simulation? Who's going to do the agents? All of those need to be in your schedule. And of course, doing these customizations. In the customizations, uh, Prisoner's Dilemma Tournament and Plague will be the hard one. Flocking and Random Walk are really just meant, you know, as kind of testing things to, you know, see if, like, see if, you know, the thing is working. So Plague and Prisoner's Dilemma Tournament, you know, those are going to be the hard ones. Um, so then the schedule, what I would prefer you to do is maybe um, do that as a... Um, um, is a Google Sheets that you can just simply share with me um, and have that be a document that you're, you know, modifying all of the time, that you're updating all of the time. Um, good. And, and then I will, like I said, I'll schedule team meetings with uh, each team to go over, you know, their, to go over their design. Okay. Um, so, so much for that. Um, let's get on with talking about threads. I'm coming back here, going to lectures. So the lecture the other day was multi-threading in Java. And um, a couple of ways to think about threads. So first of all, you know, the idea of multi-threading comes to us from the idea of multi-processing or multitasking. So multiprocessing or multitasking was something that uh, an innovation in operating systems in the 1960s. So I think I told the story in lecture about watching these graduate students when I was an undergraduate. They were all sitting in front of these terminals, and it was said that they were talking to the computer. And I, I just couldn't understand how they could all be talking to the computer at the same time. Well, it was thanks to multitasking. The ability of the operating system to switch between several tasks rapidly. Each task is running a program, so switch between programs rapidly. So it created the impression that you had the computer to yourself. Um, and so then multitasking is happening at the level of several programs running at the same time on a computer, like several terminal sessions, for example. Uh, multi-threading, the idea here is that within one of those programs, there might be uh, several threads running in parallel, uh, several functions. You think of a thread as a function, several functions running in parallel, right? And, and some, we have to maybe distinguish between true parallelism and simulated parallelism. So simulated parallelism is this switching back and forth rapidly. Uh, between the different threads or processes, um, creating the illusion of parallelism. True parallelism, true parallel processing would happen, like if you had lots of processors, and so you could have threads or prior tasks, programs running on, each of them running on their own processor. Um, here are some of the applications. The user interface thread of the program. So while you know your program is doing some intense calculation, you still have the ability to uh, you still have the ability to interact with the user interface, and you can do things like pause and resume and so forth. Exactly the sort of thing that uh, exactly the sort of thing that we're going to be doing uh, with um, um, with SimStation server threads. So here, this application is that you have a, a server, like a tic-tac-toe playing server, and they're getting requests from clients to play tic-tac-toe. And the server can't play tic-tac-toe with each client, and so what it does is it 
creates a thread, and that thread plays tic-tac-toe with the client. Meanwhile, the server goes back and listens for more incoming requests. And then this is our featured architecture uh, for this part of the course, the multi-agent or agent-based architecture, you know, which envisions a program is like a collection of autonomous goal-directed agents. And they're both like have like a loop. They're all, all of the agents, there could be thousands of them, you know, all have like some sort of a loop like this you know, while my state is not equal to the goal state, then I want to update my state in some way. An update is down here, it could do, you know, sort of anything at all. Well, you can't have several programs, several agents running a, a while loop like this in parallel with each other unless each of these agents owned its own thread of control in which it could execute this loop. And we use uh, agent-based um, agent modeling, you know, it can be used for, well, agent-based programs can be used for modeling populations, um, characters are used a lot in game development and so forth. UML has special notation for this, active objects they call them. So when you create, let me come back here, Here's my agent. I'll click on that and see down here is active. I click on that and then it sprouts these little sidebars. So then what does this look like in Java? Okay, well, um, here, let me come down here to a thread class. So Java actually has a thread class. Um, so these different threads are represented by objects. And uh, there are two ways for these things to work. Um, here, a runner, so, so the right one way, the way I like to think about a thread is think about a thread as a virtual machine. It's a little virtual computer. It has its own call stack. It has its own instruction pointer, its own registers. Uh, it's, however, going to share the heap, the heap is where all of the data lives. It's going to share the heap with all of the other threads. And here it has a runner. So the right way to think about this, I don't know, right way, the way I like to think about this, is um, if the thread is a, is a computer, then the runner is the program that the computer is running. Okay, and the runner is of type runnable. Runnable is just an interface saying, well, you know, run, you've got to have a method named run. So whatever that method is, it calls runner.run when you start this up. If it has a runner, if it doesn't have a runner, if it doesn't have a program loaded into it, then it calls its own run method. And this own run method doesn't do anything, but you could create a subclass of thread and, you know, and, and override this do nothing run method. So here, for example, is one way of doing it. So I'm creating a thread. I'm creating a little virtual machine. And I'm loading that virtual machine with a program. This program happens to be agent and agent implements. Up here, agent implements runnable. Okay, so this little while loop, which could go forever, right? We may never reach our goal. Um, you know, that little while loop is running inside of this virtual machine, and then I call thread.start. The other way, which might be easier way to do it, is to have agent extend thread, right? So here you can think of agent as a virtual machine, instead of having a, or sort of running inside of a virtual machine, like a program runs inside of a computer. The agent is a virtual machine, but it's hardwired to do this, like this, this particular while loop. And then here's how you do it. You just create an agent and then call the agent start method. And the start method here says, oh, well, I don't have a runner loaded in me, so I'm going to call this run method. But down here, we've overridden this run method. So I'm going to switch over here to and show you some demos of this. And let's start with threads one. So 
Here uh, I've got uh, agent implements runnable. Um, this state is sort of his certain, you know, his current state, and the goal is the state that he's trying to reach, and I've decided to give agents names. Um, the goal is uh, hardwired to be zero, and the state is specified here by the constructor, as is the name. Here's a little two-string method. Um, and then the run method is just like what we saw, except I'm going to, after I do the update, I'm going to do a little print line. And my update method here is the new state is the old state divided by three, and that's integer division. So pretty simple. Here is the manager class, and he has uh, an array of agents, and the constructor populates that array with a bunch of agents. And then his run method is he's going to iterate through the array, and for each agent in the array, he's going to create a little virtual machine, a thread here, and he's going to load the agent into that thread. So he's creating a virtual machine, treating the agents like programs. And then he's calling the thread start method. And after he's done that, he prints out all done. Main creates a manager and just calls the manager's run method. So let's see what happens here. We'll run that as a Java application. Okay, and there are a number of things. So here we see all of the outputs of these agents. They all eventually reach their goal state of zero. Um, there are some things, though, that are you know, not ideal with this picture. One is this all done. Remember, that's printed by the manager. And look, that prints before any of the agents get busy, which, in other words, the... This run method terminates before any of the agents have actually, any of the threads have begun executing. That's fine, I guess, unless the manager here, um, you know, there might be like a situation where these each thread is like computing part of a solution. And then the manager, you know, needs to, when they're all done, the manager then needs to you know, piece all of these solution pieces together, but he can't because he's already quit. And the other thing is, let's see where that console window goes. Uh, look at this agent three. He's a real pig. He, uh, he, he, he hogs up the processor until he reaches state zero. And then, you know, states, uh, agents two and one, they sort of take turns with each other. So, um, <laughs> So that agent three, you know, is a bit of a selfish thread. Okay. Let's see if we can fix that problem. Here's threads two. So threads two, here's the big innovation here. So my run method, I'm calling update. But then I call thread.sleep. Um, so sleep is a static method in the thread class, and whoever calls it will basically uh, get suspended for 100 milliseconds, or whatever you type in here. Now, the reason that I'm doing that is um, some operating systems that when they run threads, so each thread gets, you know, some some time slice, like maybe a second. And if it has not released the processor after one second, the operating system interrupts it and puts it back to the end of the queue and gives the next thread a chance. Okay, other operating systems, the policy is, uh, well, we let the thread run uninterrupted until the thread voluntarily gives up control of the processor. And that can happen, for example, well, with the thread ends, if the run method terminates. It can also happen if, like, the thread requests some input, like from a file or a keyboard or something like that. Or uh, it could happen if the thread goes to sleep. Um, another way, there's another static method called yield, which gives up the, the processor. So I do this by being cooperative and voluntarily giving up the processor. It'll you make it so that so that regardless of what operating system your program's running on, they all have the same behavior. So um, and then do I do anything here? 
no, let's just try that. So Right, so here you see that the agents are much better about taking turns, are much more interleaved. I still have this all done up here. So let's see if we can fix that next. All of this code is in the lecture notes. Um, so here, um, I've added a new field to the agent, a thread. So this is going to be a pointer to the thread that the agent is running inside of. So remember, the agent is the program and the thread is the computer. So this will give some way for the agent to, you know, to access the computer that it's running on. And, and coming down here, here's how I grab it. So this is a little programming trick. So thread has yet another static method, current thread. And whenever it's executed, it returns the thread. Well, if we're inside of run, then, uh, then the current thread is this particular agent. So this is how I do to catch, this is what I do in order to catch in order to catch the thread that I'm that I'm running in. That's how it's initialized. And then what I can do is I'm going to implement a method called join. Okay, and agents join method calls the thread join method. And whoever calls, whoever tries to join a thread, if somebody of uh, the manager calls, calls this join method here. Uh, the manager is suspended until the thread terminates. Let's see how we're going to use that down here. So here the manager launches all of the threads, just like before. And then, here's the magic. It's going to go through this array of agents, and for each agent, so i equals 0, agent sub 0 dot join. So the manager blocks at this point until agent zero dies. Agent zero dies when his, when his run method terminates, when he's reached his goal state. And then I come back up to this loop. Now i equals one, agent sub one dot join. Now let's just say, for the heck of it, agent one finished a long time ago. So this does nothing then. The agent's already dead. Then I come back up here, i equals 2, agent sub 2 dot join, and I'll wait until agent 2 joins. And then I print out all done. Let's run that. Okay, notice that all done, you can see I'm printing out, oh, agent 1 died early, that's weird. Uh, it, you can see that I'm printing out all done after all of the agent activity has occurred. Okay, next, um, let's see. Is it, let me just take a quick look here at what I got. Yeah, this is not, um, doesn't demonstrate this as well as I would like. Okay, let's close these guys. Let's just jump to uh, five here. So five, I'm providing you, and these are in the notes, with this class console. Okay, console is a, um, console is a user interface program, basically, uh, but old school. Okay, from the console. So the user interacts with the console by typing in commands, and the console prints out the results. And, you know, it's not really, I don't want to really get too deeply into this, but uh, here we have a control loop, also sometimes called the read, execute, print loop. I print a prompt. I read in your command. Um, you know, I check to see if it's, you know, a meta command, like, quit or help, uh, and then um, for about, and if it's none of these, then I execute the command and print out the results. And right now, execute just throws uh, an exception, doesn't really, oh, it echoes. It just echoes whatever you typed in back at you, but it's protected, and you can override it in a subclass. 
Okay, so manager, come down to manager. Manager, where is it? Manager extends console, so it inherits that control loop and all of those console features. And all it needs to do is implement execute. Okay, so here's the command, and here are the commands that I know how to execute. Suspend, resume, start, stop, and status. Okay. Um, suspend, basically I go through my the agent array and I suspend each agent. Resume, I go through the agents array and resume each agent. Uh, start, I go through the agents array, I create a thread, put the agent inside of the thread and start the thread. Stop, I go through the agents array and stop each one. Uh, status, uh, I just print out each agent and let their two string method, you know, do all of the work here. So in other words, um, the user interface has the ability to start, suspend, start, suspend, resume all of the threads. Exactly the kind of capability that SimStation needs, but instead of doing it from console prompt, SimStation's going to do it from menus and buttons. Okay, so now we have to get more serious about how agent works. So I've introduced here an enum for agent states. So our agent can be running. He's actually in the middle of his run loop, you know, update, update, update. Suspended, so he's paused. Stopped, uh, he's permanently paused or he's dead. His run loop is finished. Suspended is temporarily stopped. And I added ready here. Um, so you are running, but you are... Um, you're ready to run, but you just don't have you don't have your hands on on the processor yet. Your thread doesn't have the hands on the processor yet. And then here I've added agent state, uh, run state, which is one of these agent states. My constructor, when you construct an agent, it's born ready. Here's stop, it just sets the agent state to stop, is stopped, checks to see if that agent state is stopped. Suspend, you set the state to suspend. Um, uh, and then is suspended, tests if it's suspended or not. And um, here's this word synchronized, uh, which we don't talk to, we, we just introduced today in lecture. Basically, what synchronized means here is that only one, um, only one thread at a time can call these methods. So here's run. Okay, I grab the current state. I set the state to running. Agent state is now running. Okay, I check on something up here. Okay. I set the agent state to running. Um, I call update, and now I check to see if I, well, if I've reached my goal state, I call stop. Okay, stop will set is, will make it so that is stopped is true. That'll terminate the loop, which will terminate the run method, which terminates the thread. Here I'm being cooperative. I'll sleep for 100 microseconds, milliseconds. And then down here, wait, this is a method inherited from Java's object class, and we uh, will introduce that in, in the next section of notes. Uh, basically, what wait does is it causes a thread to be suspended until another thread wakes it up by calling notify. Okay, and that happens here in resume. So resume, I'm gonna get rid of this guy here. I think we need that. So uh, resume says, well, if you're not dead, if you haven't stopped, then uh, I'm going to call uh, your notify. Notify also inherited from the object class. Okay, and so that uh, basically gets him, wakes him up. But now remember, he just goes back waiting for the CPU so he can start running. 
while he's waiting for that processor to, so we can start running again, another thread may, uh, may knock him out again, may call the suspend again. So uh, as soon as he gets hold of the processor, he makes sure that he's not suspended. If he is, he has to go back and wait to be notified again. So we could be in this loop for a long time today in lecture. I made the analogy between, you know, somebody in a, in a brawl in a, in a bar and he gets knocked out. He's in the wait state and then notify is like the splash of whiskey in his face, waking him up. And he maybe jumps to his feet uh, only in time to be knocked out again. So he could be doing that for a long time until he finally is notified. He wakes up. He, nobody, nobody punches him again. And so then he can come back up here. Stop would mean, in this the bar brawl analogy, would mean somebody, you know, shot him. So he's still alive. And so, yay, he gets to call update again, which maybe in this case, you know, he takes a punch at somebody. What is, uh, so update, uh, so I've changed update a little bit. This is doing a mod eight counter. So it just increments the state by, uh, by eight each time. So let's try to, let's see, I think that is this one. So that doesn't look like uh, much, you know, nothing seems to be happening. But if you type status, it looks like the agents are doing something. Oh, now the agents are doing something different. Hey, nothing changed. Why didn't anything change? Well, because the agents are all suspended. Why are they stuck? Should I type resume? Do type resume. Right, all of my agents seem to be stuck in. Let's start this again. See, no, it wasn't doing this before. Now they seem to be stuck again. Maybe I've got some bug here. Let me just pause. For okay, back again. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, when I was explaining resume, I very cavalierly removed this statement. Uh, run state uh, is equal to ready. I thought, oh, I don't think I really need that. But yeah, I did need that. So <laughs> let's try the experiment again. We're going to start. There's the status. They're changing. And now let's suspend. They're not changing. Now let's resume. Okay, and now they're changing again. Now we can stop. All right, not bad. Let's see, there's another line here that I wanted to remove. Uh, manager, that is manager does not need this console field. There's another experiment that I rejected. Um, so then, um, let's see, what is this manager got?
oh, this is like our prime generator that you were working on in class today. Yeah, yeah. So, so here, what I've done is I've uh, I've changed. Agent is now an abstract class. Okay, and. Uh, I think I can change this to ready. Um, yeah, I think that'll probably be fine. So I'll change him to ready. Um, and it's exactly the same as before, except the update is an abstract method. Coming down here to the manager account, get rid of this console field. All of this code is out there somewhere. Uh, so, you know, there's nothing new with him either. But then what I can do is uh, here, for example, in class, we did this pi approximator extends agent. So I inherit all of this groovy machinery, all of these methods I'm going to inherit. right? And, and then uh, all I have to do is have this update. Pi is famously approximated by this infinite series. And so what I do is each time I update, the new value of pi is the old value of pi plus the sign. This will either be, this alternates between 1 and negative 1 times 4 divided by n. Right? Then n, the n's are the successive odd numbers. So if n is 1, then it'll be 3, then it'll be 5, and so forth. And the sign is going to alternate between 1 and minus 1, and I print out pi. Here's another thread, prime generator. He extends agent, so he implements update. So here is the last prime that, uh, here, the last prime that, that he, uh, he generated. I'm going to start it out at 1. Don't panic. I know 1 is not prime. Um, and then here's update. I'm going to increment last prime by 1. So I'm going to test, uh, well, is the next thing after the last prime prime? Okay, and now what I try to do is I try to prove that it isn't prime. Okay, so I go from i equals 2 up to last prime divided by 2. I ask, is last prime divisible by i? Okay, if it is, then it's not prime, right? Because prime doesn't have any divisors. So I increment it. Okay, I say, sorry, that one didn't work. And then I break out of this for loop here. Okay, we come back up to the while loop. We haven't found the next prime yet. So then we optimistically say, okay, next prime, this next one that I've just incremented to, it's probably going to be prime. So I set that to true. And then again, I set about looking for a divisor for it. And if I find one, then, oh, well, that didn't work out. So I increment last prime. We'll try the next one. Prime was not found, and I break out of the loop. And we keep doing this until we finally get to the next prime. Right? When that happens, I'll go through this for loop. I'll never find a divisor for it, and so I'll never set next prime found to false. So here, next prime found will be true, right? and we'll break out of the while loop, and I will print out what the prime was. So then if I run it, so the running of this is a little chaotic because everybody's using the console. Everybody's using the system. Kind of the, you can see these guys are busy. I'll suspend. You don't see it being typed in, but you can look if you look carefully. You sort of see these suspend being printed out here. All right, and then I can resume it. And I'll stop it. Okay, so uh, so what we've got then is like a little framework that I've created for um, you know for for a multi-agent program with a console user interface. Okay, let's go back to the lecture notes. So this style of Programming fits a pattern. Okay. 
called the master-slave design patterns. The master-slave design pattern, you have a master class, and the master class owns a bunch of slaves, and slaves are active objects. And this is a bidirectional uh, association. So a slave can come back to the master. In some cases, the master can provide services, you know, like a random number generation, a clock, a uh, communication. I want to send a message to one of the other slaves. Um, discovery services. So the slave might ask, is there some other slave that performs such and such a task? Uh, where I need like a, some, another partner, like maybe one slave is a buyer, another slave is a seller. So the buyer wants to know, is there like a seller who sells uh, waffle irons, right? And then the master, you know, might put him in touch with, you know, a, a waffle iron selling slave. This is just a, a diagram. We go back and see more of this diagram in the next set of lecture notes. This is Java's thread, so they have more states than our agents have, right? When it's created, it's in this special created state. And then when you call start for a thread, it enters the ready state. Now, the ready state does not mean that it's running, right? Remember, uh, it goes into a queue, a ready queue, and waits for the operating system to, to give it the processor. When the operating system gives it a processor to run on, that's called dispatch. He dispatches it. So he's now running. And there are only one, two, three, four arrows at this point out of the running state. Either it terminates, in which it enters the dead state, okay, or it joins uh, some other thread, and it's waiting for that slave to die. Uh, when the slave dies, you go back to the ready state, and we wait for the processor again. Or it could sleep, and when the timeout happens, it goes back to the ready state. Or it can call yield and go back to the ready state. Or in some operating systems, as I explained earlier, it can be preempted by the operating system itself. Okay, well, your time slice is expired. Back to the ready state for you. Give somebody else a turn, you big fat pig. Um, and I think... I think then that is the lecture. Um, I don't think I covered anything else. All right, um, more later. Stay healthy, everyone.